Okay, chapter two, torque converter operation. Now, before we get into the material, I wanna point out the Atra Plus logo. That is an indicator that the program or the bulletin or the article is designed specifically for the diagnostician. The person who's gonna make the call that the customer's complaint is either inside the transmission or something else. Let's begin. In the early days, transmissions used what's called a fluid coupling. Now this isn't a fluid coupling from a transmission, but rather it's, a, it's an excellent illustration of the internals of one. It's very simple. There are some key points that they use. Uh, one is straight veins. Now notice these veins here are perpendicular to, or I should say parallel to, excuse me, parallel to each other. One turns with the engine and the other is connected to the input shaft of the transmission. It's very, very simple. It was used in the early hydromatics. Uh, the Roto 10 had one of these. Mercedes used it early on. It was, uh, it was a good introduction uh, during that, the, um, that phase of technology, but was highly inefficient. Something else is it doesn't have a stator. And we'll get into what a stator is uh, real quick here, but it's a very simple design, inefficient, and didn't last very many years. Today we use a torque converter and there's some key features to it. One is it has a pump uh, that converts uh, engine torque to fluid action. And you'll notice that the veins, you can't see the veins here, but they aren't parallel to one another. These are cupped, which is a key feature. Number two, it has a stator. This is vital to the operation. We'll get into this real quick here, why this is so superior to a fluid coupling. Uh, next is a turbine, and you can see that it has the cupped veins, uh, and it takes the fluid action from the, from the pump and converts that into torque for the input shaft of the transmission. And then finally, the clutch or the damper, as some refer to it, and when the, uh, the transmission applies that clutch, it eliminates any slippage in the transmission and, and operates then kind of like a standard. And some vehicles will slip the clutch uh, a few RPMs to, to smooth out any vibrations from the engine, but it has the capability of eliminating all RPM slip. Uh, now, one thing that I want to point out uh, this doesn't have necessarily anything to do with this program per se, but it's a good opportunity here to mention this. And that is when you see something that refers to torque converter stall, recognize that it is specific to the application. You cannot have a 2000 stall converter or a 3000 stall converter or any stall for that matter without it being associated to a specific engine. Now, what does stall mean? All right, so you sit in the car, you put your foot on the brake, the engine's running, you put it in gear, and you floor the throttle, wide open throttle. How fast the engine can turn under those conditions is the converter stall. Let me give you an example. You do this uh, in, let's say, a 1.6 liter four-cylinder engine application. It's got a 10-inch converter. You put it in gear with your foot on the brake, full throttle, and it may have 1,800 RPMs as a stall. Take that very converter and put it behind a 450 horsepower V8 and under the same conditions, in gear with your foot on the brake, it'll go to 3,000 or somewhere like that. This is just for conversation's sake. Under that condition, that converter is deemed as a 3,000 stall converter. And so when you see converters that are boxed with those rating, it's under the, or it's with the understanding that it's for a specific application. Now, of course, they'll do things like change the, uh, the bracket so that it mounts to the flex plate of the larger engine. They may have to modify the pilot. They'll certainly braze the, the fins inside and do other 
um, uh, modifications uh, for the higher level of performance, but this is a key point as you're considering torque converters. The stall speed is only relative to the engine it is mated with. Now, this is kind of what the fluid looks like as it's swirling around. It's not just a, a torrent of fluid in one direction. It's kind of like a, a stream in the ocean or a current in the ocean. It flows in different directions throughout this housing called the torque converter. And we're gonna take a look at that specifically and understand better on how this works. So in this example, the converter uh, is attached to the engine and this housing, the pump portion, is spinning with the engine. The fluid leaves the converter and it's not only turning with the engine, which is uh, counterclockwise as you're viewing it from the back of the engine, but it's also slinging that fluid out. And that motion of slinging out plus rotating is going to give it a, a, a is going to throw it into the turbine in uh, in a counterclockwise direction, but it's slinging it toward the outer edge. Now notice that those veins are cupped. Now what's that going to do? When the fluid comes in and hits that cupped vein, it's going to redirect it in the other direction, the opposite direction. And it's also going to turn the, uh, the turbine uh, for input to the transmission. But notice this fluid. It's going in the opposite direction of the engine. Now all of a sudden, that action, the benefit of having cup veins, is a deterrent. Because the fluid is now going counter engine RPM or engine direction. And is actually going to be perceived as a, an additional load it's gonna make it even more inefficient than the fluid coupling. So we've got a real problem on our hands. This fluid continues moving until it hits the stator, and this is where the vital uh, point of the stator exists. That stator is locked in place, and it has veins that are gonna redirect the oil and move it back to the direction that the engine is turning. Notice how that, how that worked, it's now working with the engine. And this, that stator is right up inside where those veins uh, cause the oil to exit. So it has no opportunity to interfere with the, uh, with the engine whatsoever. And it's going to want to turn in the opposite direction, but it is held by this sprag. And so the sprag inside the converter on the stator is going to lock that thing rigid so that it can redirect the fluid that is coming from the turbine. Now at a certain point, the turbine and the pump portion of the converter are close to the same RPM. It's not under load, you're not accelerating. And the stator now all of a sudden, if it were lock solid, would be interfering with that action. But the sprag allows it to to uh, rotate once that condition happens. There's no input from any computer or any hydraulic control. It is simply a matter of the two components, the pump portion and the turbine portion. If it's under a load, if they're turning close to the same RPM, the sprag will allow the stator to freewheel. If you step on the gas and it's under a load and the conditions are met and the fluid wants to force the stator in a clockwise direction, that sprag will lock and, uh, and it will go into torque multiplication. Now it's easy to see that you can run into some serious problems. If that sprag fails, it'll drive as though you've got the parking brake on or you've got a bunch of bricks in the trunk. It'll have a uh, lack of power will be a condition that you'll notice. It'll drive great on the freeway but have terrible acceleration because the sprag hasn't allowed that converter or that stator rather to be stationary and redirect the oil. So that is, it is a key point and it is fundamental to the operation of this unit. That's it for the uh, converter section. Thank you very much. We'll go on to chapter three.